which might be a little hard to see, but especially at these sizes here, but it is indeed entirely there. First of all, we can see that both poles are there because we can see that stretched area on the left and on the right. And if we sort of look for some of the, um, the craters we know about, especially if we say zoom into the top right corner over here, um, and we look over here, you can sort of see some of them around here. Um, it might be a little tricksy though. I'm trying to look for a place that's like a little easier to spot. Oh, actually, at the bottom here, it becomes a little easier to see. You see here, there's sort of this big crater and these three little circles around it. Here, you can see the big crater and three little circles around it as well, right? But here it's at the bottom right corner. Here's at the top left corner. But not only that, but the poles are, are weird. Why is that? Well, probably due to some sort of internal optimization. The, and, and related probably to the fact that we cannot rotate this terrain, right? This terrain is unrotatable, right? We can't rotate it in any way whatsoever. The X and Y coordinates get flipped from what you expect for some reason. Now, part of it may have to do with sometimes textures are sort of upside down. That, that happens from time to time. That's not what's going on here. It's actually your terrain inverts your X and Y coordinates for some bizarre reason. So what we actually want to do over here is we want to um, we want to invert the x and y. Note we are inverting the x and y. So if we just do this, right? We're doing all this math based on the x and putting it in the thing called y pause, and then we're doing a bunch of math based on the y and putting it in the x pause, and then we're using that, which seems bonkers. But we're gonna hit play. I'm assuming I'm remembering this directly. Now, our world should be the right way around. Now, it's still a little tough to see because we are generating a square piece of terrain and our image is actually twice as wide as it is tall. So let's go ahead and go into here for now. We'll probably want to work with square patches later on, but for now, let's make our map twice as wide as it is tall. So the aspect ratio should match and let's hit play. And indeed, Everything looks right. It's quite obvious if you look at this big crater and the smaller crater next to it over here, you can see the same thing happen here. Big crater, smaller crater next to it over here. If we take a look, we've got uh, a pair of craters like this at an angle on the right-hand side. They are present right over here and there. This, um, I think we have to nerf our height a little bit. Now, one of the things I could do to nerf the height is I could change the vertical size this number here, 512, represents the maximum height of our terrain. Rather than take down the maximum height, because maybe we want to do some other things later on, let's just say that the terrain data we get in, the grayscale, let's go ahead and divide it by, I don't know, four. So we're only going to get a quarter of the contribution from our terrain. There we go. Ooh, and actually, I'd say that looks quite a bit more moon-like. Very nice. Um, and even then, if you look at the crater depth here, I think that's still too craggy. I think we want to go even smaller than this. Maybe maybe 10 times? Ah, see now I think that, that starts to feel considerably more reasonable. Now let's take our main camera here and just put it in a better location. Zoom way out over here. Let's take it and move it maybe next to one of these craters. And you can see how the, um, the quality of the terrain rendering changes dramatically, not only in the number of triangles, but also in uh, when we get some texture mapping in here, it will change dramatically uh, depending on how far away we are from various details. So I'm going to move you here and I'm going to go ahead and bring you upwards shroomp, to get you sort of inside the world over here, which is going to become a lot more important once we get some texture mapping. I'm then going to tilt you down a little bit here. There we go. So we had a, a camera view. Now, as soon as I stop the program from running, all the changes I made to the camera are going to get reset to the the original settings. So if you want to save it, the easiest way to do is to copy your object, stop playing it, you can see all our coordinates got reset, paste your object back in, and then delete the original or, or you know, there, you can also copy a component settings and things like this. But now I have a camera at my new location. So now if I hit play, it'll be back where I put it in. Boom. Uh, CS and uh, Zoltan, I guess I should just call you Zoltan, eh? Um, Zoltan has an excellent question. What if you put the height map as the texture? And you could. The other thing you could do is get another copy of the topographic map 
that is more like photographic instead of topography. Um, and you absolutely could do that, but you have to remember that this basically doesn't represent the true color of the surface of the moon in these areas. It just represents height. And really we're getting all the color that you're seeing here is mostly because of the shadow, which looks kind of fine. We could go and implement that. And it's actually probably not a terrible idea. The idea that maybe lower areas actually should legitimately be darker. How come I'm not getting the bloop bloop from my, um, from the, uh, the subscription sounds? What's the deal? Hmm. Apparently it's a day where we're just going to have a million computer problems, so I apologize for that. So we could do that. That's that's 100% we could do that. Um, well, ish. The thing is, you don't apply a texture to terrain directly. You never, ever, ever do that. Um, not in the terrain engine. Instead, what you do is you have splats. So you don't, you never have a, uh, a texture, as far as I know, that gets applied just to the entirety of the surface. But instead, you can hand paint various areas. And we can do that live now. If we go here... I turned my speakers off. Oh, you guys can still hear it. Am I still getting the buzzing? No, but I don't know what the sound's going to be like. It's probably going to deafen me. I didn't turn it off. I just turned it down. And now I'm not getting buzzing anymore. We're going to see what happens. Someone subscribe so I can hear if I get deafened. Anyway, um... Bum, 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 bum. Yes, better way, click the gear at the top of the component. And you're right, transform is a component, so I could actually just copy that and then paste it in. I've done that before for other things, though, too, and I forgot that you could copy the transform info, but you're absolutely right. That works very well. Um, let's say we go and add in, again, a texture over here. So first we design the um, moon ground. Add that in. Now, the first texture in here gets automatically applied to everything in your surface. Then if you go and add another texture... And again, we'll put in the red because it's super visible. Add that in. You can grab this and then you can start to paint it onto your world over here. And that's generally the way that you texture your, your terrain because it allows you to make dirt spots, rock spots, grassy spots. You can really mix it around. Uh, I did hear the sub sound. Thank you very much. Um, so that tends to be the way you do it. So how do we get things to look good? One of the cool tricks you can do, and this is actually, there's an example of this in Unity documentation because it's quite a typical thing to do, is what if, so I have the ground texture and I have a cliff texture. Right now, I did paint it red, um, but I'm going to go, I've got a, uh, a the, the normal gray one as well over here, making it red just to make it really easy to spot at first. Um, what if we automatically made it so that you know, flat parts are just ground, but parts that go up, wouldn't it be cool if the side of these hills get painted with the cliff texture, which you see in most games because um, it's very easy to do procedurally and it sort of makes sense. Like you wouldn't, a lot of times you don't, if it's steep enough, you do tend to get exposed stone and a cliff surface and things like that. Can we do something like this? Absolutely. freaking -lutely. So first thing we need to do is you can see every time I do this, right? I have to add textures. We have to add texture number one, and add it, and there it is, and then you have to add texture number two. These have to be part of the train engine, so I have to do that. So first step is gonna be, how do we get these textures in here? Well, that's quite easy to do. Well, easy once you figure out the documentation. I gotta say, the train documentation for Unity is pretty weak sauce. Um, there's a lot of things that aren't really explained in detail, which is unfortunate, because there's a lot of things that are called blah map, and you're like, well, what does that mean? Like, we're gonna be working with an alpha map, Alpha what? What? Huh? Who? <sighs> so, let's make an array of textures. Texture 2D. We're going to make an array of these, a public array. And we're going to call these the splat textures. Because that's what they're called. Um, it should be a capital S because it's public, just for convention. Can I please not delete code? Thank you very much. Okay, so we've got these textures in here. We're making it public. Thusly, we can go ahead and add over here our spot textures. There is a trick if you want to add more than one thing to an array. Like normally you'd sort of, it's easy to drag one thing in there, right? But if you want to drag two, so I want to select one and then the other, and then all I'm doing is selecting the textures. So how do I drag it in there? One thing you can do instead is you can lock the inspector. So no matter what you click, it'll always show you that one object you're locked on. So now it's locked on dynamic terrain, no matter what I do. Now you can grab more than one thing and drag them in here. Although I think this will actually add three and it will. Um, the other thing you can do is you can just um, type in the size of your array, which in this case is two, and then drag things to each individual components. But if you want to drag a lot of things to an array, it's very handy to do that lock trick. Super good, it's one of my favorite tricks to figure out. Um, actually want ground and then cliff. Now, 
we've got that. So now we actually have to tell this system. So we've got, all right, we generated the objects. We're building the train. I guess we'll do something like build splats. Um, and we do want to pass the train data to this because it's still an aspect of that. So we're going to have another function over here, void build splats, which takes in terrain data, terrain data over here. Uh, I think I've got that right. Splat prototypes. I, the words in this is fantastic. So we can, the terrain data has a array called splat prototypes. New splat prototypes. We got to set the size of the array. Well, we have um, we have our splat textures, right? So let's say we create an array, splat text textures dot length. There we go. So all right, now our terrain data has um, has an array of splat prototypes on it. If we do go ahead and run this, don't pause. It's compiling here. There we go. If I hit play, and we look at our train, and we go to oh. Oh, we actually get an exception because the elements are, are null. Yeah, okay, fair enough, fair enough. Um, for i is less than, um, I guess, splat textures dot length again. And for each one of these splat prototypes, we set a new splat prototype like this. So now it's not null. We might still get an exception. It's possible it still won't like this. I'm just trying. I'll, we'll see. If it doesn't, it'll be kind of interesting to show. Wait, what? Did I? No. Oh, you can't. Okay, right. It's one. I'm like, why am I getting an error here that something is null? You can't do the assignment to the train data yet. We need to do something like splat proto splat prototype array called splat prototypes. We got to generate the array here. Then we have to populate it, which right now it's just going to be populated with empty splat prototypes. Then we assign it to the train data because this looks like an assignment, but it's actually going through a property that's doing some error checking. I think that's what was going on there. I was very deceptive though. Okay. Now we're getting an array index out of range. Um, at line 87. Oh, yes, of course, because this also has to just do that. You know, I'm trying to do something simple to show something. There we go. Okay. It took a while, but we got there. So now we're running, and if we look at our terrain over here, and we look at the, the paintbrush, and we look at textures, there's actually two blank textures here now. That's good. So the next step is to say, okay, so we created a new splat prototype. We now want to give it the, the texture, which is going to be equal to our splat textures i. There we go. So now if we hit play, our textures are no longer blank. We have our ground and we have our red cliff in here that is loaded in. And again, we can paint the red cliff in there. Excellent. Excellent. Um, I will say one thing. The size of the textures won't look very good right now. And it's actually, it's slightly visible. It might be a little hard to tell, but it's very repeaty right now because one of the things you can do when you set your textures is you can tell it the size. And I found that this will look a lot better if the textures are much, much bigger. There we go. Um, and we'll do the same for both. And I found that about 150, but I just took 10 times the default size looked a lot better for the train we're working with and the textures that we're working with. I found that looked stronger. So, okay, we can do that. We can, uh, we can make set it here because it's just flat prototypes dot, dot size, tile size, which is a number. So let's go ahead and make another array here, which is an array of, um, would it be a float or a, oh, it doesn't, tile size. It was a vector two, yeah, but we want it square, so that's going to be fine. Um, so let's make it an array of floats called uh, splat 
sizes like this. And so we'll just use splat size um, new vector to splat size i, splat size i, like that for the tile size. And then we'll make sure to feed that in. But 150 looked about right. Bye, Rhino. Do, do, do. Rinder, or compile, compile, compile. It's an array of size 2. Now we could use a structure for this or a custom class to make this a little cleaner. But let's just go with this for now. That's going to be fine. So now if we do it, the splat size will be correct. But it's still not being painted anywhere, right? Still not being painted anywhere, but it's looking better. So now what I want is on all the sort of the, the cliffs, I would like that if that were painted red, which I could do by hand, right? If I take the brush and I drop the brush size down, maybe the opacity as well, right? And then I find a spot. Well, it's still way too huge as a brush size. Yeah, I guess we'd have to go very tiny. That's true, actually. We would have to go very tiny. There we go. And sort of manually sort of paint the cliff sides, you know, in our cliff color in some fashion, right? That, that's what I'm looking for to have accomplished. But I would like to have it do it happen automatically. That we can do. So we have the build splats over here. Let's go ahead and um, do a paint cliffs function. And again, we'll pass in the terrain data. Obviously, the terrain data could be a, um, a class uh, like property over here so that we don't have to keep passing it to the functions. But this doesn't really hurt. There's not really any additional overhead. And it does let us keep um, sort of breaking things down into sub steps, which becomes a little bit more important later on if we're trying to figure out ways to do um, multi threading. So, paint clips. This will not work. Because I need a function that is part of the terrain itself, not terrain data. So this needs the terrain to get passed to it. Because terrain has a function called get steepness. Where is it? Is it terrain data? Oh, it is part of the terrain data. Never mind. Okay, good. Look at that. This is a function that you pass it an x, y coordinate in real world coordinates, unity space coordinates. I know, we keep changing our coordinate system. But this is an unity coordinates, I think, as opposed to 0 through 1. Train data. Let's just double check here. No! It's 0 to 1. Never mind. Float x float y, which we will set to something, x and y have a range from 0 to 1. Because, you know, why, why should we have one consistent set of coordinate systems to work with? Terrain engine! Woo! Uh, excellent. So, what we want to do is we want to pull every place we can paint our splats right, which is based on resolution of things, we want to pull that spot, find out what the steepness of that area is, and then based on the steepness, we want to paint on our terrain texture. And one of the nice things you can do when you paint on these terrain textures, that's where the alpha map comes in, you actually paint it on with a intensity from zero to one, where one is 100% this texture gets painted, zero is 0% 0 this texture gets painted, and somewhere in between you have a certain amount in there. So as it gets steeper, we can paint the cliff more and more and more. We can also decide on breakpoints and different things like that. Now, I'm going to open up my reference here because, again, this is this is the sort of thing that is really easy for me to completely bone up. So we paint this to the alpha map which can potentially have a completely different different resolution from the actual terrain, which is part of the reason this get steepness doesn't take in an integer, because you don't have to ask for the steepness at any particular point. You can ask for a steepness that's actually in between two points of the mesh, right? You've got point mesh here, a mesh point here, and you can ask for a steepness sort of in between, and it'll calculate all that based on all the things. And of course, we can calculate that ourselves too if we were good at math. Well, it actually wouldn't be hard because you would just have to make a vector and then take something orthogonal to that and then you get an angle. But bleh. We'll just use the helper function. Although it's worth noting that if you're doing threading, right, if this is coming in as a multi-threaded thing, this function has to be called from main thread. It's actually the only bit in my test 
that I got screwed on where I couldn't just multi-thread the whole thing unless I wrote my own calculation for calculating steepness at an arbitrary point, which wouldn't be hard. Because what you do, because this can't be called from a thread, and nothing nothing can. Nothing that interacts with, um, I think you can interact with a splat prototype, that's okay. But you can't do anything that reads, reads or writes from train data. Luckily, that's okay, because like, for example, here, where we're building the train data, right, we're creating this heights array. You can create this heights array on the main thread, and then your sub-thread can modify this heights array. That's perfectly fine. And then when that thread is done, you signal the main thread that, hey, I'm done calculating this, and then the main thread can take this height stuff and feed it back into the terrain data. That's perfectly fine, and you can cache a lot of these values. Like, you can't interact with the texture either in, a, in your secondary thread, but you can you can pull this data out in the main thread and then just work on it in the secondary thread. That's all fine. Same thing here, these height map width and height, you can't touch this in a sub thread, but you can cache it and that's okay. You can do all the work in um, a sub thread very easily with the exception that if you need to access the steepness, you can't do it in a sub thread. So you'd have to write your own get steepness function. Bilinear inter interpolation is another really good um, question there. I mean, yes. That was another thing um, which we're not doing in here, and we could actually. What we could do here for the color pixels is rather than do this, see, I wasn't doing it because the function of um, equals height map pixels dot um, inter or it's bilinear. Uh, sorry, height map texture. Right? Rather than getting the pixels here, you can say height map texture um, get pixel bilinear by just feeding in the UV coordinates, which you can get from Y pause, or I guess you'd be going X pause, Y pause. You can do this as well. Um, and the reason I wasn't doing it is because when I did my practice run, I was doing it threading. And this is another function you can't access in threading. Although you could easily write your own uh, get pixel bilinear um, based on this pixel height data. You could do that. So I don't think it makes much of, I think this will continue to run as is, or, well, it's gonna complain about get steepness, hold on. Let me just comment this out. You, go away. There it is. In practice, I don't think um, the get bilinear um, pixel value is gonna make much of a difference, but it might, depending on the mismatch between your train resolution and your um, your height map texture resolution over here. So yeah, you may as well use it. But again, if you were doing multi-threading, you'd have to write your own, but that's okay. Okay, so we still want to paint the cliffs. So get steepness is in here, has to be called from the main thread, um, and the X and Y have to have a range of zero one. So obviously what we're going to do is we're going to do a loop. Now, our terrain data has an alpha map which is the size of our splat textures. So what we're going to do is we're going to make a for loop, which is going to be, I guess I'm going to do AX, which is the alpha X, which is going to be capped by terrain data dot alpha map width. And another for loop, which is going to be a Y, which is going to be terrain data dot alpha map height like this. So we're going to loop for every pixel that can be painted onto our map, we're going to loop through. Um, then for that, we're going to find out what our 0 to 1 x and y will be, which will be ax divided by this, and ay divided by that. So now we have a value that goes from 0 to 1. So then we can get the steepness at that location, x, y. So this is going to be an angle from 0 to 90 degrees, is what this is. Where an angle of 0 is flat, an angle of 90 is as vertical as it can possibly get in our terrain engine. Remember, there's no overhangs or anything like that. So clear this out. And then we want to paint our splats. We want to blend between our two splats based on this angle. So um, let's see here. Hey, I want to give a big thanks to all the January Patreon supporters and these mic check supporters, Yukofin, Snoopy TRB, Pavel Zdanov, 
Zdanov, yeah, Drazion, Jan Torivel, Michael McClintock, Aaron Toivson, Craig Mortel, The Not-So-Evil Engineer, Julien Auger-Lafont, Marius Fieldvold, Speedy Savant, Steven Steger, Valiant Cakefeed, Wes Oldenboving, Michael Knudsen, Jason Yanity, Stephen Bonnerman, Kale the Quick, Neil Blakey, Milner, and everyone who has watched, shared, favorited, and surprised, su <laughs> subscribed to this series. Thank you very much.